Hi, my name is Anita Novak, and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 11 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by John Wood, who is the founder and CEO of Yugo, a nonprofit organization that helps ambitious and promising young women in low-income countries pursue higher education. He's also the founder of Room to Read, an award-winning NGO that has served over 23 million children in 43,000 communities in 20 low-income countries. To do that, he raised over $750 million dollars of capital. Goldman Sachs has named John as one of the world's 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs. He's a five-time winner of Fast Company's Social Capitalist Award and was selected for the inaugural class of Young Global Leaders by the World Economic Forum. And at the invitation of Bill Clinton, he served four terms on the Clinton Global Initiative Advisory Board. And the accolades and the awards and the media appearances go on and on and on. So I'm going to encourage everyone to check out John's wiki page below, which I'll include in the show notes. Finally, John is author of three books. His first one is a Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, which was featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show, which is how I came to know about John. I'll get to that in a minute. His second book is Creating Room to Read, tells the story about the organization and how it grew faster than Starbucks. And his most recent book, which is what I looked forward to having a chat about, is Purpose Incorporated, Turning Cause into Your Competitive Advantage. John, thank you for making the time. Welcome to the show. Great to see you, Anita. I was absolutely excited that you said yes, because I'm taping um, four episodes in April um, with featuring people that I wrote stories about in my book. And so thank you for making the time. I want to start with your latest initiative, which is so exciting. You call it sort of the, the natural extension of Room to Read. And so I know that Yugo provides financial scholarships you know, funded through by through individual donations and corporations. And when I went back onto the website, just to remind myself about the whole thing, I was stunned to see $800 can send one girl to university for an entire year. Okay, tell us about the problem and why we should all care about this. Yeah, very definitely. There are, in our generation, in our lifetime, there have been several glass ceilings that have been shattered and many glass ceilings that have not yet been shattered. One of them is university access for young women in low-income countries. In low-income countries, there's a really big conundrum. Number one, there are fewer university spots than there are in wealthy nations like, let's say, Sweden or Canada or America. Those slots overwhelmingly go to the children of the elite, and they, the majority of those slots go to men. So if you're a young woman from a poor family in a rural area of Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Vietnam, Cambodia, et cetera, the odds are stacked against you that you'll ever have a chance to go to university and make a better life for yourself and to have a career. So you go is all about picking up sledgehammers and shattering that glass ceiling to help many, many, many more young women. Um, we'll get to it. And I'm hopefully at some point in this podcast, I would like for this to be one of the largest scholarship programs in the world uh, mm -hmm. at the university level, because it is so inexpensive um, you know, you're not talking about paying $80,000 a year to go to Columbia or Cornell. You're talking about one one hundredth of that amount can make the difference for a young woman in a place like Bangladesh or India to go to university. Why is it that inexpensive? Well, number one, the governments of these countries quite often subsidize public education. Number two, we're raising money in strong currencies like Swiss francs and, and U.S. dollars and um, Japanese yen and putting it into um, currencies in places like Cambodia and Vietnam where a dollar goes a long way. And third, quite often these young women come from extended families who will also provide some small help. Um, so you guys not doing everything to help the young women, but we are the catalyst that really tips the scale to allow those young women to go to university. Uh, and we guarantee every one of them, this is not a one-off scholarship. As long as they perform academically, we'll be with them every day through the day they graduate. And so I know I, I've asked you this before, you know, what keeps you going? And you say, you know, when you were at Room to Read, it was the ribbon cuttings of a new library. I'm curious to know, have you already had some impact stories hearing from women, young women, how, how it's changing their lives? Yeah, I actually received an email a couple of days ago from a young woman in Vietnam who I had met the week she was admitted into the program uh, last September. 
And she just wanted to drop me a mail to tell me in her in, info to IT exam in the first semester, she had scored 10.0 out of 10.0. She had a perfect score. Um, you know, we have young women, my wife, Amy, and I, and a number of friends have sponsored informally because we, we had a number of years we were doing kind of a beta test, if you will, of what would eventually become YouGo. This was not incorporated as a charity. We didn't have tax status. But I had met so many young women during my journeys who wanted to go to university and they didn't have anybody who could help them. And I think for me, part of my room to read journey for 20 plus years and part of my before that, almost a decade with Microsoft, what I learned as an entrepreneur is you have to constantly ask people, what are we doing well? But more importantly, what are we not doing that you wish we were doing? And for my readers at Room to Read, the number one answer was, my daughter's not done yet. Secondary school is great. We appreciate the support. My daughter wants to be a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a policewoman. To do that, she needs to go on to higher education. And the family couldn't afford it. And so I would have these moments when I would feel like I went from the joy of being in a, in a village where we felt like we made a big change. And then when that young woman and her mother approached me hand in hand to, to ask me, will you help my daughter go to university? And I had to say, room to read can't be all things to all people. Uh, we have to stick with our core competencies. I probably sounded like a McKinsey consultant as I was saying that. Uh, that, made, that answer made sense in the head, but in the heart, it felt horrible. And it felt even worse when I would see that young woman and her mother where their eyes would meet and they would just look to the ground crestfallen. And then I would stop and say, well, but I can help you. Here's my contact details. Email me, we'll figure something out. And I would end up, you know, at Safeway grocery stores, Western Union desk, you know, <laughs> sending $500, $600, $700 to a young woman in Nepal so she could, she could go to nursing school. Um, and so we actually have this whole group of graduates. And if people go to our website, which is UGO, you go ugouniversity.org, we have a number of videos of those young women who are now, uh, one of them, Hawe from Cambodia, the oldest of 10 children. She not only helped put all nine of her younger siblings through secondary school and several of them through university, but she's now living in Germany, in Köln, and she is studying for her master's degree while also studying the German language. And, and that's a girl from rural Cambodia. That literally was $800, it was actually about $600 in her case per year for four years and boom, that just took her to the whole new level. One more little crack in the glass ceiling. And I, I'll offer as a PSA, since we're next month gonna have Mother's Day, anybody listening, just tell tell your partner and your kids to just put money towards that. I don't know any <laughs> woman that would not appreciate a Mother's Day gift and help support a young woman like that overseas, go to university. God bless Don. I really love what you do. I want to share how I came to know about you. So I was at my sister's house. She had just had her first child, um, my nephew, Anthony. She was nursing. We were watching Oprah. My mom was in the living room too. And you came on. And well, you have very beautiful blue eyes, but I also mm. just loved everything that you said. And I remember saying to my mom and my sister, I'm like, I'm going to marry that man. <laughs> <laughs> and you're married, you've got a son, I'm married, I've got a daughter, we're all good. But we've stayed in touch all these years. And I just have admired, admired, admired um, everything that you've done that I've written about you. So for this podcast, I plan to share the story. Um, and then I would love to hear uh, your thoughts and reflections as it's read back to you. And then we'll talk a little bit more about Purpose Incorporated, which I think is okay. a very important book. So after eight years at Microsoft, John Wood quit his job as director of business development in China to launch a nonprofit dedicated to global literacy. Now, you can interrupt me at any time, John, if you want to add something, okay? Okay, I probably will not interrupt you. Taught to set bags, big, hairy, audacious goals by Steve Ballmer, John aspired to reach 10 million children by 2020. If I was going to give up millions in stock options, I wasn't going to play small, he says. The approach worked. By leveraging his corporate playbook, Room to Read surpassed its target five years early and outpaced Starbucks for a decade, building more libraries year over year than the coffee giant Open Stores. Today, the NGO has impacted more than 28 million children from Bangladesh to Zambia by partnering with over 40,000 schools and training 10,000 teachers every year. Those are impressive results by any standard, but to John, they're just a good start. Quote, we've reached only a small percentage of children who need us. 
he says, and the idea that a child can be told she was born in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that's why she can't get an education, belongs on the scrap heap of human history. What prompted John to leave his thriving corporate gig to bootstrap a charity? Well, here's a hint, purpose. John admits he's always been a bookworm. When his parents wanted to reward him for something, he didn't ask for toys or treats. Instead, he begged them to stay up late and read. Rather than respect the eight book limit at his local library, he negotiated a secret agreement with the librarian <laughs> to borrow a dozen at a time. Reading remains his lifelong passion. After a major burnout at Microsoft, John needed to tend to his mental health and figured a hiking trip in Nepal would do the trick. One afternoon while sipping chai, he met a local education department official um, who, where was I, uh, who invited him to a school in the village of Bahundanda. He accepted and the next day visit a ramshackle building. He was devastated to see that it had no age appropriate children's books, only two backpacker cast offs. What were they, John? Uh, I remember that one was in a, was a Danielle Steele romance novel, and I think the other might have been uh, Umberto Eco. No, A Lonely Planet Guide to Mongolia. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That Umberto Eco might have been in a different library. Okay. Both under lock and key. The headmaster said, we're too poor to offer to afford an education, but until we have an education, we'll always be poor. Then he uttered nine words that would forever change John's life. And they were? Perhaps, sir, you will someday come back with books. Yes, indeed. Back in Beijing, despite being ridiculously busy preparing for a high-profile visit by Bill Gates, John was more focused on emailing friends around the world, asking them to donate kids' books for Bahundanda's first library. Within two months, he'd collected over 3,000, all warehoused in his parents' garage. The following year, he and his 73-year-old dad returned to the Nepalese village accompanied by six book-bearing donkeys. Anticipating their visit, the community had built wall-to-wall -wall bookshelves in the schoolhouse. The morning of the ribbon-cutting ceremony, John was delighted to learn that two boys had snuck in overnight, unable to resist the wait. At the official opening, I watched kids erupt with joy. They were literally falling over themselves and raptured by images of sharks and roller coasters and a solar system, John recalls. It reminded me of the reverie I felt in my hometown library. In the words of Simon Sinek, John had found his why. When he had first announced his departure from Microsoft to start an NGO, people told him he was having a midlife crisis. I thought the real crisis would have been for me not to follow my calling, he says. These days, when asked about his decision to quit his job, he replies, did I want my tombstone to read that I had cranked out 29 consecutive quarters of earning growth for some big company? No, I respect those who go that route, but that wasn't for me. After 20 years of championing global literacy, John stepped off Room to Read's board to help launch a new venture that tackles the logical next challenge. Yugo helps ambitious and promising women in low-income countries pursue ed higher education. And in his spare time, John coaches executives and organizations on how to turn purpose into a competitive advantage. His website reads... I believe we were put on this earth to do more than just make money. Our careers can and should stand for something bigger than just ourselves. You have a future in audiobooks, and I'm, I mean that. You have a, you have a very melodious voice. I, I know my story, and I loved hearing it. So you can do that as a side gig. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's your legacy, right? And that's what you're about. And so how does it feel to hear that as part of your, your life's journey to date and, 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 and now what you're looking forward to doing? Um, it feels great. I, I think I was drinking beer, not drinking chai that, that afternoon <laughs> in Nepal after a long day hiking, but my, my publisher might've changed that to chai. So it would be, you know, a little bit more palatable for the children. Um, but yes, no, it, I mean, it feels, it, it look for me, it feels like it's just this very logical arc. I'm, I'm a, I'm a somewhat, um, I don't know how you describe me, but I, I like things to all make sense. I live my life inside Excel spreadsheets and the way you describe that, um, or I guess you, you describe my life, it does make sense because even when I was at Microsoft, even my first year at Microsoft, I was trying to convince my coworkers to do social projects. Um, my first, I think I joined Microsoft in April of 91. December of 91, I went around 
and just collected money and said, I'm going to go to Costco. I'm going to take one of those, those barges they have at Costco. I'm going to fill it with food to donate to the homeless shelter. And people gave, I don't know, 700, 800, 900 bucks. I went to Costco with $800 of cash and then just loaded up. And I called the homeless shelter in advance and said, what is it you need? What do people not give you that you need? And they needed frozen meat. They needed frozen protein. They needed, they said, we have lots of pasta. We have no pasta sauce. And I kind of like became known within Microsoft as being a little bit of a do-gooder. Um, and I, I've always felt like, gosh, we're all, life's never easy, but if you're a McGill graduate, or in my case, a Northwestern, a Kellogg MBA, we have pretty good lives. We still have to work hard and play by the rules. And life is not always simple, but compared to most of the world, we have it really good. And so my thinking was always influenced by my parents. My parents didn't have a lot of money, but they were always volunteering. Um, if, if my father heard a fire, uh, a, a four alarm fire at three o'clock in the morning, he would make up, he would wake up, make a pot of coffee, throw a couple of stuffed teddy bears in the back of his car and go to the fire site. And he would bring blankets and teddy bears to the children who were traumatized. He would bring coffee for the firefighters. So I'm getting teary eyed thinking about that because my dad worked so hard. But my mom had time for the Red Cross. My mom had time to always look out for other families. And um, so I think just why should business be any different? Business, yeah, you got to make profits or you don't survive. I have no, I'm a capitalist, I'm an MBA. But I just look at it and think, what is the point? Like, if we make all this money, what is the point? Like, I look at Jeff Bezos and I think, dude, I wish you'd just give me half an hour and we could sit down on a whiteboard and sketch out how you could, maybe he doesn't want to be influenced by his ex-wife, Mackenzie. But if you look at what Mackenzie Scott's doing, you know, and she dropped a $25 million gift on Room to Read in the summer of 2021. And that was one of my catalysts when I thought, you know, Room to Read's amazing. It's in phenomenal shape and it's got great leadership. Maybe this means I can go off and do something new like you go. So I'm going really random and circuitous right now, Anita. I apologize because you asked a very simple question. But I think for me, what it comes down to is there is no reason to be in business if all the only thing you're trying to do is feather your nest and get richer. At a certain point, we all have enough. At a certain point, more does not make us faster car, bigger house, whatever it would be. I don't care about that stuff. What I want to know is I want to wake up every morning and know that I'm here for a reason. And in this case, it is basically I want to help those who have lost the lottery of life. And I, I think a lot of people who are in business want that and need that. But quite often, they need people to inspire them to say, it's okay. I, I'm your permission slip. You can go do good for the world while still actually also doing good for your company. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt a great conversation. I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are over 120 equally awesome conversations of my podcast and YouTube series on my channel. Please subscribe. The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. Yeah. And I'm going to talk a little, we'll talk a little bit about the sort of personal benefits of, of purposeful work. Um, but I want to ask about the business case since you've, you've mentioned yeah, this, yeah. You, your whole book is making the business case for purpose embedded in the DNA of the organization and that it actually is wrong to think that they, they are, you know, do good and do well financially are separate, right? I mean, we kind of have a, an instinct around that now over the last few years that's changed, but tell me, tell me, like, make the case for us. Why is that so important? Yeah, for sure. And and so if someone's asking, you know, well, who's John Wood? Why are you a subject matter expert on this topic? I'll tell you just the quick backstory is at Room to Read, we quickly realized that if we went to companies with our little begging bowl and said, hi, we want to be, be part of your charity program this year. The dollars allocated to the charity programs were very small. And there was a line out the door of dozens, if not hundreds of causes asking Credit Suisse and Goldman and UBS and Google for money. What we said was, let us help you to build a bond with your customers based around shared values. So working with skincare brands like Tatcha, and every time Tatcha sold one SKU, they would donate $1 to Room to Read, so one girl could go to school for one day. They called it Beautiful Faces, Beautiful Futures. Um, they've now sponsored over 5 million girl days of schooling. And they built an incredible brand with their customers by saying, yeah, you can buy from the giants like Estee Lauder or P&G uh, but when you, or L'Oreal, when you buy from Tatcha, you're helping young women in the developing world go to school. 
Uh, we worked with Mark Benioff and his founding team, uh, Suzanne DiBianca, Julie Trell at Salesforce when they were a startup and we were a startup. And Salesforce was brilliant. They basically said, if we're going to win the war for talent, we have to prove to people that we are here for a reason. So they did the pledge 1%, 1% of equity, 1% of profits, 1% of time, go to good causes. And it's not a coincidence that Mark Benioff came from Oracle, where he's, he's quoted as saying he felt like at Oracle, nobody really cared about the world, they just cared about themselves. He built Salesforce and Room to Read was a really big part of how they motivated their employees through an annual trip to a place like Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Nepal to go see our work. We worked with Goldman, Credit Suisse, other big banks to say, let us help your employees to understand that when you're making money, you're doing good things. So in Credit Suisse's case, it was post tsunami. Let's go together and help rebuild schools and libraries that were destroyed by the tsunami in Sri Lanka. I think any company that views purpose and profits as being antithetical notions uh, is living in the past. You can, you should, you will ideally have both. So if you wanna build a bond with customers, win the war for talent, motivate your employees, lower retention rates, keep on the right side of, of not only government regulators, but also citizen regulators who are online saying either good things or bad things about companies, there's nothing better a company can do than to say, let's figure out how we can stand for something bigger than just profits. Yes, profits matter. We have to have them or we don't survive. But what are we doing to prove that we are at our heart a good company with values that cares, that makes things happen on the social front? Yeah, so important. So, so, so important, especially with the younger generation. I mean, all the students that are coming through my classroom, they just, they don't get it that we aren't doing more to fight climate change or to deal with income inequality or to help with public health. So the war for talent, for sure. Um, yeah, and okay, I think so then, if I can throw, can I throw something in there about that just really quickly is, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs really get that. Um, and so like Atlassian, for example, the Australian was once upon a time a startup, now it's a public company, but their co-founders, Mike Cannon Brooks and Scott Farquhar, who became close friends, were absolutely brilliant. They realized early on that not a lot of people knew about this company Atlassian. And so rather than giving out free trials of their product, they said, we don't think free is a good word. It just means we don't value our software. They said, well, you can download 10 of our apps, 10 apps, $10, but all $10 goes to room to read. Uh, and they raised not only over a million dollars that way, but they also got the word out about their product, which brought in A, new customers, B, brought in employee referrals, and they built one of the greatest companies, an incredible talent base, IPO'd the company, and did very, very well for themselves, while also doing good for the world. So for those who are in big companies, I'd say beware, because the entrepreneurs get this, I think, more than the big companies get it. But when the big companies get it, that's great because big companies quite often have more resources, more people, more ability uh, to do great things. And, and YouGo is on the hunt right now. We want to hear from entrepreneurs, we want to hear from corporations who believe that by helping young women go to university in low-income countries, that is the thing that can be an advantage for their business, for motivation purposes, for recruitment purposes, and for purposes of, purposes of bonding with our customers. Yeah, yeah. So on, okay, so that's the business case. I, I, I've i bought in and if people have more questions, read this book. Um, towards the end of the book, you talk about also the personal benefits that we all reap. I mean, I was very intrigued not too long ago to learn that Maslow, you know, the hierarchy of needs guy, just before he died of a heart attack, he was writing voraciously about how wrong his theory was or how sort of limited his theory was because in fact, the pinnacle of human achievement isn't self-actualization, it's what he called self-transcendence. This idea is that we become all that we can be and then we become of service to something bigger than ourselves. And I find that just such a beautiful newer model mm. to think about. And so just maybe mention from your own personal experience, but then also from um, from the research that you did for this book, what is of benefit to us to play in the playground of purpose? Well, let me, let me quote Vicky Sai, who is the co-founder of Tatcha. Tatcha was an in independent company. They bootstrapped themselves, eventually sold to Unilever for $500 million. So their investors made out, you know, I'm sure very, very well from that. Um, but when I interviewed Vicky for the book, um, she said, you know, being an entrepreneur is tough. The, the business magazines kind of make it look very, very easy. But she said, there's days I didn't want to get out of bed. And she said, on those days, I would roll over, I'd grab my cell phone, and rather than looking at my email, I'd look at, I would look at photos of my four-year-old daughter and I. 
in Cambodia with the Room to Read girls. And I tell myself, get up, get out of bed and go sell product. Because every time you sell a product, one of those girls gets to go to school for a day. I think for me, intrinsically, what keeps me motivated in life, what keeps me interested is every day, I just want to know that I've raised enough money so that one more, five more, 10 more, 15 more, 20 more young women in low-income countries can go to university. That, that's my purpose in life. I do a lot of work that helps to pay the mortgage and pay the bills. But ultimately, how am I going to measure myself when I'm old and sitting back and looking at my life? It's what difference did you make? I want to know, know that there are tens of millions of young people. Maybe now they're not young, no longer young, but they're adults who look back on their life as a young person and say, my life changed the day that I got a Yugo scholarship. My life changed the day that somebody from the Ayala Foundation in the Philippines, which is our partner, called me and said, congratulations, Anna. You are going to nursing school. You are going to be a nurse. That to me is better than than anything. I own one modest house. I own one five-year-old Volkswagen. Um, I don't need a lot. Um, what do we all need? We all need to know that we wake up in the day and we go to bed at night knowing we made, it, we made a difference in life. And there's certainly, I don't do it for this reason, there, as you and I both know, there's there's so many benefits to having a purposeful life. Studies show that people who have a sense of purpose have lower rates of dementia, on average, they live eight to 10 years longer. They have better mental health. They're just more pleasant to be around. Nobody wants, I don't want to be a grumpy old man. <laughs> Nobody wants to be around a grumpy old man. People want to be around those who exude enthusiasm, who say, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe this. I mean, I, I love nothing more than, and I did it a lot in my days at Room to Read, and I'm doing it now with Hugo, of taking friends along from anywhere in the world to say, Hey, come to Manila with me in May. We're going to spend a day with 15 to 20 of our Yugo scholars. You're going to be blown away when you meet these young women who have overcome every obstacle from the death of their parents to growing up in poverty and who are now on the path, the glide path. Um, my friend, Jeff Phelan, who is uh, uh, along with, with you, a fellow Canadian, Jeff is in Vancouver, uh, is a phenomenal executive coach who coached me pro bono. Um, and I once asked him, you know, Jeff, you've studied... Judaism, you've studied Buddhism, have you come up with what you think is a secret to life? And he said, yeah, but it, the secret's not a secret. Um, he said, the, the whole point is very simple. It's visualize what you want to say in your deathbed and work backwards from there. And if what you're doing in, today is in alignment with that, then just keep on keeping on. But if that's out of alignment, then you need to start kind of right, moving the battleship towards that. And so I know what my purpose is. Uh, and so it's cool. I just get to wake up and just execute against it. Um, but I think for me, partly the way we grew Room to Read and the way that I'm growing Yugo is to be an open book and to invite people in. So to say, you don't have to go invent, reinvent the wheel. If you think that children's literacy in the developing world is important, you don't need to go start a new NGO. Just get a hold of the people at Room to Read and say, hey, I want to be part of it. I want to join your band and let's, let's turn it into a super group. With Yugo, same thing. If people care about women's empowerment, women's economic development, making places like Pakistan a more equitable place, helping kids in places like India and Nepal, you don't need to go reinvent the wheel. You can get involved in these existing organizations like Yugo. And that's why I think for me, um, we're humbly expecting to be a success. Uh, we have a thousand young women already welcomed into the family. We only launched just over a year ago, but we now have a thousand young women in the program, we funded their first year. We've set aside cash reserves to fund years two, three, and four. So every one of those thousand girls, young women is guaranteed. We're with them to the end of graduation. We're now in 2023 funding cohort two, we announced yesterday uh, that we'll be welcoming in 1,250 young women into the program this year uh, and fully funding all four years. We'll, we'll fund their first year with cash and we'll keep the, the remainder in our reserve funds that so they're guaranteed. So by the end of this year, we should have 2,250 young women in the program. Um, I compare that, for example, again, humbly, but if you think about some of the well-known uh, programs named after billionaires, the Schwartzman Scholars, the Gates Scholars at Cambridge, the Michael Dell Scholars, we're at, we at UGO are gonna be bigger and already are bigger in some cases than those programs founded by and named after billionaires. Why? Because it's not one person naming a program after himself. This is not the John Wood University initiative. We wanna create an, a vessel, we wanna create a, a vehicle 
that people can jump on and help me drive and help me put fuel in the tank and help me press the accelerator and go, 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 go. So ultimately, if you look out five or 10 years, it might sound a bit grandiose, but I believe that bold goals attract bold people. I would hope that Yuga will be the biggest or one of the biggest university scholarship programs in the world. We can do that because it's not costing us $50,000, $100,000 a year uh, to change a life through university at a first world university. And those, I will be very clear, are very valid, very good things to do that are meaningful. So I would never denigrate any other program. We need more scholarship programs in the world, not fewer. The difference with Yugo is we make a little bit of money go a long way. So anybody who wants to can be like Gates, be like Dell, be like Steven Schwartzman, do it through Yugo. And collectively, we can make this one of the biggest scholarship programs in the world today. Oh. I love it. Okay. Everybody who's listening and watching the Yugo link is in the show notes. Okay. Penultimate question. What role sure. does empathy play in your life and in your thinking about the world? Uh, I, I just think empathy is everything. When I, when I have it, I'm my best self. When I don't have it, I'm my worst self. When I honk at somebody who is too slow accelerating out of the red light, I, I get about six nanoseconds of satisfaction. And then my wife, Amy, looks at me and is like, really? I'm like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have, didn't have empathy for that 85-year-old person who was too slow off the mark. No, I, look, I think that if we can just go through our lives. like I lived in Hong Kong for a number of years. And one thing that just, I loved Hong Kong pre where it is today. Let's, I loved it through about 2019. Um, but one thing that drove me crazy about living in Hong Kong was that the rich often treated the poor really, really badly. Um, mm -hmm. People would walk into the five-star hotel and the doorman would open the door for them. They wouldn't look the doorman in the eye and they wouldn't say thank you. Uh, the person would come over to fill the glass of water. I remember being with Joe Tsai, uh, Alibaba Joe Tsai, uh, at a conference. We were both speaking at the Milken Institute conference in Singapore. And in the briefing room, um, Every time that the guy came over to fill the water, Joe Tsai, Alibaba guy, super billionaire, would look at the person and say, thank you. And I was like, oh, I like Joe Tsai. I already like Joe Tsai. Now I like him even more. And to me, empathy doesn't have to be something that is complex. And I, I mean, one of the things I loved about your book is there's just constant examples of people who are implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And empathy can start not by saying you have to go change the world, but simply just by being a little bit nicer to one person once a day. And then maybe double that to two people you're nicer to. And then maybe double that to being twice as nice as you were yesterday. And I think when we do that, um, just mentally and spiritually, we just feel good about ourselves. Um, every time I'm a dick about something, um, it, it feels, you know, I don't know, whatever. Like you get like that five seconds of like, yeah, yeah, I really told that person what I think. And then you're like, oh man, I just burned a bridge and I didn't need to burn. And I just wasn't a good, I just wasn't a good person right then. And, and so I, I try to avoid being a bad person. Um, and to reminding myself to be empathetic helps me to kind of uh, tamp down that, that negative side of me. Sure. And the last question, thank you so much, John, for your, yeah. this has been a great conversation. The last question, which I ask all my guests and I love, I love asking it because it always, I never know what to expect. Um, can you think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for you? Yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you warned me about an hour and a half ago that you were going to ask this question. And I was no, because I was out, I was out, I was out, um, uh, out on a nice walk, uh, morning walk, taking in some, some, some San Diego sunshine. And I challenged myself to tell you a story I've never told before. Um, and so I've told a lot of stories about people being nice to me, but I'm going to go back to 22 year old John Wood, a student at the University of Colorado in Boulder, go Buffaloes. Um, I had been chosen as the university's um, nominee for a prestigious internship in Connecticut. And, you know, you're going to think this is this is horribly cool and sexy, Anita, that I was a candidate to be the intern at the Financial Accounting Standards Board the FASB, the people setting the rules for the accounting industry. It was a prestigious scholarship. I was so excited. I mean, it was like a serious nerd alert at this point, but I flew from color from Denver out to New York. I was supposed to get to Stanford, Connecticut for the interview. And I went to get in a taxi and I said, this is, you know, a long time ago. I said, Do you take credit cards? No, next taxi. No, next taxi. No. 
Stanford, Connecticut is probably about a half, about an hour, hour, 20 minute ride from New York. So not that close. I was pretty naive. I went to the ATM. My card wasn't working. The bank was not letting me take out any money. And I was panicked. So I went to the United Airlines desk. I'd flown on United and waited in line. And the clerks might help me. And I said, yes. And I said, is there any chance you can cash a check for me? Explain, no, we don't do that. And I was almost breaking down in tears. And I said, I've got this internship interview. I didn't explain that it was with the Financial Accounting Standards Board that I was doing my internship interview. But I was nearly in tears. I explained to her I needed to get this interview. And this was like, this was everything. This is going to make or break my future. Um, and she looked at me and she pulled out her wallet. And she gave me $100. She gave me five $20 bills and said, here, good luck. And I don't know how much a front desk clerk at United makes, but I know there's a lot of money for her. And I tried to give her the check and she said, no, keep that check. You might need it. You don't seem like you're the most prepared traveler that we've ever seen in the history of the airline industry. But here's my address. When you get back to Colorado, send me, send me the money. Um, wow. I mean, a total stranger trusting some naive little snot-nosed 22-year-old accounting nerd um, yeah. That's a great story. That is a great story. And look at you throughout your entire life, what the ROI of that hundred dollars has been. You have been paying <laughs> it forward, doing some empathic action on behalf of children and especially girls around the world ever since, man. And I failed at the interview though. I failed at the oh. interview. <laughs> And this is, this is a great thing though, because like sometimes people fail at something and look at my life. Like what if I had like become, yeah. uh, you know, the expert on the financial accounting standards for how we <laughs> accumulate amortized depreciation for oil wells. Like, oh my God, that would have been like the worst life ever. And with no offense mm -hmm. to the people doing that with their, their life. But yeah, so I failed uh, at that interview, but uh, sometimes good things come from failure. It opened up new doors. Well, I don't know where you stand on the whole spiritual side of things, but I think a higher power intervened in a big way. So that's what I have to say about <laughs> you not being on the accounting, whatever, whatever. John, thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for being you. I've said it and I will say it again. I will not be surprised when you are nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. So hmm. thank you all for thank listening. You. Oh, and, and congratulations donate. on the book. Congrats on the book. I'm super psyched <laughs> for you. I loved watching the reveal you posted on LinkedIn. Your reveal was really, uh, was really awesome. <sighs> Thank you, John. Thank you all for watching and listening. We'll see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you for watching another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Remember, this show is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. If you want to get involved, share this video, subscribe to this channel. See you next week. Thank you so much.